Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about something slightly controversial, and it's going to be slightly contradictory with some statements I have made over the years, but not really, because I think what we need to understand is that oftentimes I say things and say more often than not, and in the case of things like full range of motion, right, that's one of the things that I say more often than not. A full range of motion is going to have more hypertrophic potential, which also means that there are going to be exceptions to that rule. And we have to think in terms of workload, stimulus to fatigue, all of that stuff, meaning it's, it's a more complex statement than that. But it's generally accepted that usually, you know, a longer effective range of motion probably has the potential for a little more gains. But then we come to some really tried and true exercises like the floor press, and the JM press that are considered to be mainstays in strength sports in the athletic world, both for chest development, increasing your bench press strength, tricep development, all of these things. And they're technically partials, right? They're technically partial movements. Uh, they're not extreme partials. They're not half reps, right? But they are partials. And I think a point to consider, two points to consider, really, we can talk about stimulus to fatigue and peak tension. But I think when it comes to the range of motion topic, um, I try not to be dogmatic. I try to keep up with what the best coaches, the best researchers, everyone in the world is doing at any given time. And I try to keep an open mind to the concepts of successful coaches, right? I try to keep a very open mind. We don't want to be dogmatic. We don't want to be so open-minded that our, our brain falls out. But... We need to be open-minded and be willing to look closely at things that really good elite coaches are doing. And I saw a debate the other day, and the thing that popped in my head immediately was the floor press. And it was a debate, and it was quite a long debate, well over an hour long, I saw between uh, Christian Thibodeau, who I know, know slightly, I don't know him particularly well, uh, who is himself a very respected strength coach, and Dr. Joel Seedman, uh, who is... Again, researcher, PhD, who is also a pretty well-renowned strength coach at this point. And one of the points that uh, Dr. Seedman had made was that in his observation of the, the scientific literature, as well as his anecdote observing many, many athletes and clients over the years, is that he's noted that generally phenomenal, if not ideal, hypertrophic potential is reached on movements where we go to 90% of the joint angle, right? What do we mean 90% of the joint angle? Well, look at the floor press. Look at where our elbow is in relation to our shoulder, usually on a floor press. Look at our joint angle of the elbow on a JM press, right? Right there at the JM press, the arm is usually bent about 90 degrees, and at that point, what's happening? The tricep is under peak tension at 90 degrees. So much so that a lot of times we use accommodating resistance on this exercise just so that we keep that peak tension there and they can load it heavier on the way up when that tension is unloaded. Well, the floor press, what happens with the pectorals? It's at basically a 90 degree joint angle where we come to our full range of motion and we have to reverse it. Okay, the floor press isn't a dead stop, it's a reversal. It's a reversal from a hard stop. And it requires you to maintain a very large amount of control. So it's a very controlled eccentric to where you maintain super tight position. And then right at that 90 degree angle where the triceps touch the floor, you take that very controlled eccentric and you reverse it immediately. Okay. Well, what he was saying is that from a general hypertrophy perspective, that he doesn't believe that it's it's full range of motion of a joint. It's hitting that peak tension, finding movement patterns where you can really hit that peak tension at about 90 degree joint angle. That's why he likes to stop squats there. And that's a very controversial thing that he does. That's a point of debate. That's even one of those where I go, oh, I don't know about that. But it was interesting they talked a lot about West Side and the guys basically squatting to a box that takes their knee to a 90 degree bend and still walking in and some of those guys being able to squat 700 pounds raw on a completely raw squat if necessary, who don't even train it because it built all the musculature to do it, okay? 
But West Side generally, and even the way I box squatting now, is, is, is a 90 degree squat, isn't it? And he kind of pointed that out if we want to come over just to the elite strength world to step away from the research, which is what he, he bases on. It's like they coincide on the squat. So he's actually pointed out that, look, my research and data and what I do with my guys actually overlaps perfectly with some of the most elite lifters in the world with what they've been doing for decades. It's like, so it's not that far-fetched. It isn't. And they were on and on about squat, but the floor press popped into my head during that discussion because I realized that's the same thing that happens with the floor press. Well, what is it that everyone notices with the floor press? No matter what your structure is, because for me, the floor press stops about an inch short of my chest. But I can't sink it, so it's easier on shoulders. I can't sink it. But I stop, it stops for me is about an inch off my chest with this particular grip. But that shoulder angle, we're at 90 degrees. And that's where the peak tension would be placed on the pectoral, right? Without any extra stress on the shoulder joint. Well, the floor press has been noted in a lot of research. And I understand that EMG data is not always perfect. And it cannot be the be-all, end-all. But it's interesting that floor pressing produces enormous pectoral activation. Even though it doesn't quite take the full range of motion, it tends to hit the upper chest super hard, the lower chest, everything. It crushes the flat bench. It turns out on EMGs at least to give some of the best stimulation. Okay, Which by itself wouldn't mean much because we know that EMGs are, are far from perfect. right? And most of the, the most experts agree with that. They're far from perfect. It can be a very flawed system. But what do we see in the real world? Tons of guys who focus on the floor press end up having really big pecs while doing no other pec work. And it carries over to the bench really, really well. And what is it that we can do with it? Well, it has an amazing stimulus to fatigue ratio. Let's, let's think about that. So it places the pec at that 90 degree position as far as the joint angle goes. Right there, peak tension on the chest and you have a reversal at that point. So control the centric and then reverse and explode up. No ability to use leg drive. It's harder than the bench. So since we don't use leg drive on it, we have to use the pec to reverse it. It lights the chest up while teaching us tightness on the bench. You can build a really, really impressive bench press off nothing but floor pressing, by the way. But you can also build a pretty big set of pecs doing it. It kind of comes back to that point he was making about the, the degrees. I've always said, well, it has to do with the tightness and it has to do with the stimulus to fatigue ratio, right? It's easier on the shoulder joint so we can do more sets, right? If, it's, if we recover easier from a joint and connective tissue perspective on any exercise, we're going to have more growth potential from it because we could do an extra set or two every week without beating ourselves up. And we know that quality volume is the driver of hypertrophy. Okay. See where I'm going with this? The stimulus to fatigue ratio is, is phenomenal on the floor press compared to other pressing. And it also trains you to bench and learn how to put, use the chest to drive out of the bottom. And then, of course, you can add leg drive later to add, do a lot more. But it also puts us at that exact joint angle that he's talking about. It's exactly what he's talking about. Even though he was talking about the squat, it does the pectoral in the same position without overextending the joint. Probably why it works so well. It's that combination of those factors. It's not just one factor like I've been going on about. Um, I think he may be onto something. All right, what are we doing with the JM press? The same thing. JM press is technically a heavy compound. It's like a mix between a closed grip press and a skull crusher, but it's considered to be a partial movement, right? Because we're only really bending the elbow to 90 degrees. We're not actually taking it as far as we possibly could. But what are we doing? We're placing an enormous load really on a multi-joint exercise because it does use the other muscles to get you into that position, right into that 90 degree position on the medial and lateral head of the tricep. Well, many a power lifter has noted that the JM press can be a superior tricep builder for carrying over to the bench press. Why? Because the most important part of the tricep to the bench press gets loaded with very large amounts of tension and that peak tension is at that 90 degree joint angle. 
that uh, Dr. Seidman's talking about. Therefore, while these are technically partial movements, this is the reason they work so well. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.